thank you very much uh, to Virak and Barrel Elite. Um, it's the second time that I'm that I'm here. It's a, a fantastic pleasure to be moderating this panel. So, uh, my name is Pavel Sabic. I'm a founder of Tell Me More Ventures. So, what we do is an advisory firm for uh, data companies and alternative data uh, companies that focus on go-to-market as well as thought leadership initiatives uh, to generate more uh, more sales more business growth. Uh, I'm affiliated with S&P Global, and I've been there for uh, nine years. I used to run the professional services business. Um, with them, we, we focused across, across the globe. Prior to that, I was at State Street working with large silver and wealth funds as well on their risk management processes. So what I will do is just uh, give the opportunity to, to my panel to introduce themselves and give a brief background um, to their company. Hi, uh, my name is Frank Nielsen. I work for Fidelity Investments uh, for the last seven years uh, as the, uh, the head of quantitative research and risk management for um, the strategic advisor unit of Fidelity, and, uh, and that's the uh, managed account business that focuses on uh, retail and wealth management as well as 401k managed account um, clients, um, and, uh, and it's a multi-asset allocation uh, business where we invest mostly in, uh, in mutual funds as well as in um, um, separately managed accounts where we also invest in single securities. Yeah, I'm Armando Gonzalez. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Raven Pack. Uh, and my business is all about analyzing unstructured information from news, uh, filings, social media, anything that is being said by anyone anywhere publicly that might affect securities. That's the kind of thing that we, we capture systematically. Uh, and I started in this space almost 20 years now, uh, working in, in AI in general and big data, uh, which are now big buzzwords. But um, back then, it, it was a very interesting area of research. Uh, and there weren't that many companies, and now there's tons of them. Uh, so it's an interesting, interesting time for us and, and for the, the opportunities that we're seeing in the marketplace. Uh, hi, my name is Samir Gupta. I'm the head of data for internal alpha capture business at Point72. Uh, it's been a fairly recent role for me. Prior to this, I was actually doing what's relevant to this conference, which was leading the data sourcing efforts at Point72 across sectors, across geographies. Uh, prior to coming to Point72, I actually did a startup in natural language processing and was pitted against Armando's uh, Raven Pack, uh, this company was called iCentium, so that's how I got started in uh, all data as a vendor and uh, almost like, you know, one of the few vendors who existed at the time. And uh, prior to that, I've uh, been uh, on Wall Street uh, having done stints at Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and New York Stock Exchange. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So it's it probably useful just to uh, set the scene in terms of, you know, the definition of alternative data. Everybody has a kind of their own definition. But I would say working in this field for, for a while, I mean, really, it's anything that is unstructured data. So outside of the fundamentals that we're looking at, stock information, you know, it is uh, unstructured data that needs to be standardized and needs to be linked in some sort of way to the fundamental data set. Um, and this, uh, you know, example is, of course, a weather data, transactional data, credit card data, uh, and even uh, the, the kind of esoteric data that's coming out now, and unique data is around, for example, uh, jet planes, private jets that are being chartered by high net worth individuals uh, that potentially will do large deals with, let's say, a Berkshire Hathaway for people to potentially, you know, identify a mega deal. So there's a lot of really artistic ways of this data being used. And I think. What's also happening is the growth in the data is huge, right? So you have uh, data that I think Microsoft came out with a statistic that in the last two years, um, the amount of data has been created was more than any of the years combined in the past. Uh, another thing that we're seeing in alternative data is the market is growing uh, rather fast. So it's about one billion in terms of the, the data that's being purchased. Um, throwing that number out there, it could be a little bit different. Uh, potentially going to go to 1.7 billion in next year. So therefore, to the next five to seven years, we're looking at seven to eight billion dollar business. Um, so it's it's growing extremely rapidly. But the unsexy due diligence comes into question, and what we're going to do with the due diligence element. So I think to start off with would be a great question is just a you know a very broad question to say how do you, with your respective organizations, 
tackle due diligence. And I think it's fair to say that it's still a very, very early um, methodology, a very, a very early policy that's being rolled out, and there isn't any definitive uh, way of doing it. So yeah, how do your organizations tackle that right now? Uh, sure, I can start out. Um, so within um, strategic advisors, um, due diligence is a key component of finding the right managers. So we invest in fidelity and non-fidelity managers. And we have a team of um, 30 fundamental analysts who basically do due diligence by going on site to the different managers, have a lot of discussions about their investment disciplines, their investment processes. And, and so that's a large chunk. Um, and, and that's all basically driven by uh, traditional fundamental data. More recently, um, we started looking, uh, particularly for sub-advised accounts, to look at trading patterns and, uh, and try to use machine learning to identify sort of non-linear patterns within the trading. So are they good at buying, selling, selling at the right time? Are they buying stocks that sort of fit the investment style that they promote? Or are there sort of surprises in the stocks they are acquiring or selling? And, uh, and so we are playing around with uh, not so much new data in, in this particular area, but more with uh, machine learning techniques um, and, and different statistical methods to capture some of the nonlinearities that um, we historically have ignored. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, due diligence is boring, right, but necessary. Um, there, are, there are aspects of, specifically in the alt data business, uh, there are a lot of, a lot of companies that sell data that don't really understand what it means to sell it. Uh, and so when you go to a customer and you expose your product, if you as a company are not really familiar with where you got the information and how it was curated or harvested, or you don't really understand the nuances that the customer will need to address, then there's no way you will succeed in ever entering one of these firms, like yours, for example. So that, that to me is, is an important part of everybody, both on the sell side or on the, let's call it the, uh, the sell side of, of market data, which are providers, and then the buy side, which would be ultimately the customer, being able to understand the needs of both sides and also being able to provide a data set that is worthy of compliance and ultimately is going to overcome that boring stage of checking boxes so that you can get to the fun part, which is analyzing the data, back testing it, and finding out if it has any real value. Uh, so as, as, as we um, think about uh, data sourcing and, and, and bringing in data sets and doing the diligence around that, we sort of take uh, three very important uh, steps in that direction. And the first, whoops, uh, the first one is compliance, second one is quality, and the third one is actionability, and I'll talk about each one of them. Uh, for us, it starts and ends with compliance, and, and Armando, you, you alluded to it, so it's, it's about making sure that the vendor can explain that they have the, the rights to collect data, they have the rights to distribute data. Uh, they, you know, vendor forcing, almost forcing the vendor to do a very, very rigorous job of making sure there is no personally identifiable information or in information on any individual in the data set. Now, this, this step is extremely important uh, in that we don't stop at the vendor's word, but we actually do a double check on our side to make sure that there's no PII by accident that makes it to us, so that's one. Uh, coming to quality, I think it's, it's, it's a pretty uh, standard set of quality measures, starting with history. I think, I think we are very rational in our approach when, when it comes to all data you don't get the 10, 15 years of history that you associate with fundamental traditional data. So we, we're sort of cognizant of that. We look for two to three years. So you can do the year-over-year -year turns. You can get a sense of the seasonality, which is very important. You look for any gaps in the data set. You look for any anomalies. And as long as the vendor can explain those things, uh, that, that sort of like you know, is a check mark in the diligence process. And finally, I spoke about actionability. And by that, what I mean is, is uh, does the data answer the questions I have? So in this day and age, you can source data in two different ways. You can be reactive. There's a, there's a deluge of data coming from everywhere, and you can be reactive on your back foot, and we don't take that approach. We are actually uh, very, very proactive in that, and we know what we're looking for. And we, we, with that sort of hypothesis in mind, we go out and very quickly figure out where to look and then, and then, and then carry out the steps that I just mentioned. Yeah. 
thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to pause it there, put a little line there. We're going to come back to that. We're going to turn to Adam, who's joined us. Thank you very much. So you owe us all drinks because you were late, but this conference believes in reciprocity, so you will get them back in return. That's no problem. Uh, what we did do to start off with, we just gave a brief introduction to ourselves and the, uh, and the company that we work for. Um, and then if you uh, like also, the first question was just around due diligence. How do you guys tackle that in your organization? So three things for you to get kicked off there. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Adam Bohanek, I am with uh, Mardo Capital. I'm a uh, partner, uh, chief operating officer of the firm. I oversee uh, our quantitative analytics, alpha generation team, uh, technology, among other functions of the organization. So in terms of how does your firm tackle uh, alternative data due diligence, and what we said on the panel is that um, it's very early doors. There isn't any standard uh, practice to do that, even which team should be doing that, depending on if you're on the buy side or the sell side. So in terms of your organization, you know, where, where does that sit, the due diligence, and how do you guys approach that for alternative data? The ultimate due diligence, it all rolls up to the alpha generation team. So we're an asset manager. We're in the business of knowing what is and what will happen to the asset classes. Now, both of those kind of sides of this equations are very important, but knowing what is means understanding what is at the present time moving the market, what is the market pricing in. Having the right data for that is, is obviously the first step. So it is, what we see in the industry is, and what I've seen in other places, a lot of people do it kind of backwards. So there's data team that kind of falls in love with some data because a vendor came in and present or they went to some conference and they've heard about the data that they want to be using. And, you know, they find data sexy and sexy data. Um, and, you know, they want to find out how it could be applied, how it could have any predictive power. And that's, like that to me is a backwards process. The first step is really understanding what is, what is the information that alpha generation signal needs to have. Um, and then looking for that information across all sorts of data sets and then thinking about what is the data set that would actually carry that information, which is a, you know, driving it all the way from an alpha generation perspective, not from a let's test out various data sets that um, are available or coming uh, our way. So it is, to answer the question, kind of long, make long story short, it is, it reports all the way up to the CIO what alternative data is being sourced, what, what alternative data, the pipeline of what is being evaluated, assessed, and looked at. And then from there, it's only the due diligence process starts. Okay. Thank you. So can we just throw out like one, let's talk about like one particular data set that's in demand, right, from, from, uh, from Armando and... Um, uh, sorry, and Samir, um, what's, if you can give us one data, a data element that is sought after right now, and, and like, what's the process of going through that to integrate it and make sure that it's finally ready for clients to consume? Sure. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, we don't talk, talk about data sets per se, but I can talk about a generic data set in the process we, we deploy. So, as I you know, said in my previous point, it has to go through compliance and everything else. It has to... So, to fit the bill for a hypothesis uh, that we're trying to, to answer. And once, once you pass that, then you bring the data in. And, and typically, it's, it's a, it's a cross-functional team. As you, as you build your uh, data uh, and analytics efforts, you'll find that the, it, it ends up becoming a cross-functional team where it starts with a data engineer who will take the data set in to uh, to and and provide and perform some cleansing and and you know quality checks and then and then very soon a data uh, scientist takes over and and uh, starts looking at the data starts looking at the trends sometimes it's just pure statistical approaches that could work um, more recently as, especially as the data sets change in their cadence you you need to bring machine learning tools into play which is what uh, Frank you mentioned non-linear patterns, you know, you, the classic regression doesn't work, and that's where machine learning and pattern recognition becomes, uh, becomes interesting and, and, and useful. To then um, having somebody who sort of knows the markets, who understands the businesses, sees what's coming out of data, more often than not, it's not, don't expect it to be a one answer, because that's not the best way you, uh, that's not doing justice to all data if you're looking for an for a answer 
on the output end, but it's just, you know, you've broken the problem into smaller problems, and then you've taken one or two data sets, and you've taken the outputs of that and said, okay, both of these sources or three of these sources all point towards there's, there's acceleration in this particular sort of fa facet of the business I'm looking at. And then you take that, and then, and then it's almost like integral calculus. You've done it for a lot of different things. becomes a digital mosaic. You put it together. Ultimately, it drives the, the, the number, but that comes from the human, not from the AI. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously going to be biased. I'm going to talk about sentiment uh, derived from news because that's, that's what my business does. But to be critical of it, I think it's, it's also one of the data sets that's been around for the longest, right, uh, in addition to market data and fundamental data. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the reason why it's still around um, is because um, both news and public sources are a great forum mm -hmm. to express all sorts of opinions and views and facts and figures about everything that is happening in the world today. Mm -hmm. So and I then attributing that to like a positive or a negative sentiment towards the stock, for example. Exactly. So whatever is being said about stocks or bonds or markets, uh, emerging economies, etc., that tends to be very well captured in public sources. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also a very clean source of data in that you don't have to worry too much about personal data. You don't have to worry too much about sort of private information being disclosed in ways that are illegal. So it's really it's a good source to start from. But there's a lot of it, mm. and it's very hard to process, and that's where natural language processing and other technologies are very useful at helping us ignorant humans manage those abundant amounts of, of data and turn it into something useful. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I would I would you know also argue that sometimes you don't really know what you're going to find in a lot of these data sets, and I think it's mistaken to start thinking that you know what you'll find but have much more of an open mind around what you could find, but also try to understand what you're putting into the, the picture. And a lot of the errors come from not understanding what those inputs are and then leading to correlations that are perhaps unreal or learning and creating features for machine learning programs that simply spit out garbage at the end. So I, I do believe that you need to understand what's going in, but you, le you need to let the scientific process evolve and allow you to find something that you didn't necessarily expect when you started. Right, right. So you have the correlation versus causation. So if you have negative uh, earnings call for a C4 coming out and using long-winded words that are quite difficult to understand that could need an MBA or above, usually it's an indicator that they're trying to hide something versus revenue is up 25%, boom, we're done. So how, from terms of, uh, you know, from your side, the buy side, how do you guys, like you were saying, how do you get through that noise? How do you make sure that it's actually a signal and not just you know, another bit of data. Right, yeah, so I think, um, so that's why you still need some quants sitting around and then really trying to analyze and, uh, and try to make some sense out of it and then bounce it off with the fundamental and the qualitative managers to see if, if it makes intuitive and economic sense because if it doesn't, then it usually gets rejected right away. So I think the statistical significance is one piece and, and that's one of the challenges with a lot of the data and I think you mentioned new sentiments that were out for a long time, so there you actually can do quite a bit of statistical analysis. But lots of the other alternative data or big consumer customer data really don't have much history, and, and therefore it's, it's more the cross-section where you have a vast amount of data, uh, but within the same economic environment of the last couple of years, so you can't really make the same level of, of really significant um, projections of uh, what these data may imply. Okay. Um, uh, Adam, do you have a take on this? So, I, I do have to admit, I am a data skeptic. Um, you, from my experience, you get a lot of data and you feed it to data analysts and they will find a way to generate alpha out of it. The problem is it's not gonna work, right? And I've seen it over and over again. And the, and I keep going back to, you know, the discovery process really has to start with knowing what it is that you're looking for and then identifying those data elements and then using them properly. Because if you just fish for data, find various data, you will generate alpha out of it in a back test and then in sample, you can do out of sample and you can do all sorts of analytics and proper statistical methods on it, it's just not gonna work. Um, the key to what we're trying to do is always finding the data sets that are, uh, that are very long data sets. That's one 
the only thing that I found that actually works. Finding signals, data, time series that go back not just to the 90s, but go back to the 70s and 60s. Now, with alternative data, that's very difficult, extremely difficult, and most of the alternative data doesn't really go you know, much beyond you know, 2000, but that's, that's just the nature of it. So you know, if it doesn't go back to the 70s, we're just not using it. And that kind of eliminates a lot of the kind of searches for, futile searches for um, some phantom alpha that may exist or may not exist. Um, we just don't know. And we're not gonna put anything to use unless we know that we can make sense out of it. Yeah, but I think the, the older the data gets, the more skeptical I would be, right? Because you, you now enter an area where you don't really understand where the data came from or who collected the data, how, how good they were at ensuring that the data was properly timestamped. Uh, so you're probably essentially looking at information that isn't necessarily a good observation of reality back then, but you're treating it as if it is. And th because it's long and because you have lots of it, you, you consider that some of those errors will be washed away in your analysis, but they tend not to. The, the, great point, but we just don't use the data that is sketchy. So it is, you know, if you want to look at the interest rates back to, uh, you know, in the 50s, that data is, exists, and that's a solid data. You can, you can look at it, and you know that it's, uh, it's real data. If you want to look at, uh, uh, you know, consumer credit, it gets harder. So we're, again, we're a global macro shop, so we, we don't look at the individual data on a stock level or consumer level. Uh, we look at broad economic indicators, and those have existed by and large for, um, uh, you know, for multiple decades now. So there must be a, a lot of skepticism when it comes to uh, security, right? So obviously GDPR, and you, you wouldn't touch certain types of data if there's a litigation potentially going to come from there. So we, the only data that we uh, that we're looking at is publicly available data. Mm -hmm. We we're not uh, trying to even look for proprietary data sets. That's more of a um, uh, equity shops that do that. We don't have a need for it. Okay. And yourself, Frank, in terms of you know the security of that of that data, and you know what what percentage of your, your portfolios do you use alternative data in your in your strategies? So far, a very very small percentage. I think what Fidelity is um, the broader Fidelity is is doing right now is to really see if we can leverage and, and analyze our customer data. Right. So, for example. Uh, if um, customers call into Fidelity to get financial advice, those phone conversations get recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we have records of all the trading that happens that brokerage clients are doing or that our managed accounts clients are doing. We have uh, trillions of dollars under administration for 401k plans and can see if, uh, if the participation rate increases, if the asset allocation changes, if, uh, if companies hire more people, for example, or, or get rid of people. Um, so basically, we are trying to we, we investigate right now if we can actually look at any of these data um, or if, um, so if there are information call, barriers, etc. First point of call is internal data. That's right. their first start. You don't and look I at think, the vendors. Right. So I think at this point, given that Fidelity has an enormous amount of data available, uh, I think the goal and the hope is that we can actually leverage these internal data. And I think that is a key, um, could potentially become a key competitive edge because I think nobody else has these data. Yeah. And I think that's where um, I think these... Um, Alternative data sources will really make a huge difference in the future if you have some proprietary data sources that uh, are really unique to your investment process or to your um, uh, investment philosophy. And in that same example, so S&P obviously have a plethora of data, alternative data, and we've acquired four companies in the last couple of years, but the data internally, the clicks are, are really important. So for example, if we could see that, let's say, this is an example, this is not what happened, but um, it could have done. If WeWorks, for example, had an increased click rate on its cash short-term uh, assets, and then it, the click rate went up 450%, there'd be a need to look into that and start the analysis. And then if there was some credit um, indicators that people were looking at, you know, prior to all of this um, that's coming out right now, you know, that's a very good indicator to start analyzing more. So um, in terms of the vendor side, how does that kind of balance out from what you guys are providing and maybe is there a, a way of looking at clients' data themselves and then helping it parse it out, standardize it, link it, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, uh, most of the world's data is actually not on the public internet, but actually living inside data silos. Uh, so I do agree that the next wave of, of out data is essentially coming from within fidelities of the world, right? 
Uh, and as these organizations, if you look at exchanges, if you look at big banks, they have so much information about their customers, about markets, about transactions, about you know, even you know, things that governments might be thinking about doing, uh, and yet it's all sort of partitioned and, and compartmentalized. But the problem is they don't have the technology to even look at it and don't have any technology to make sense of it. And as that parts of AI and, and big data start to evolve, I think they're the ones that are gonna have a much better picture about how the world is going to change. And those of us that are in the outside world are gonna struggle to understand it from public domains. And, and I think that's part of the, the challenge in democratizing this type of data uh, and making sure that even as consumers, right, that we have or exert rights around our data and try to get ownership of that data, even living within these data silos. So all these factors are gonna, think, are gonna play an important role in how our ecosystem is going to change. And it's those that control the data are the ones that are gonna be better at markets. Mm -hmm. Samir, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, I think from our perspective, uh, uh, we, we've been doing uh, or working with alternative data for a number of years now. Uh, we've made a very significant and sustained commitment um, to investing in data and analytics. And uh, as long as our compliance filters vet a data source, we have the expertise to be able to look at that data set, no matter what the structure, no matter what the shape. Uh, uh, so again, again, we, we, we don't lose sight of the fact that there's a problem. It's not the data which drives the problem, it's the problem drives the use of data. So that is very clear to us, but uh, again, it has to pass the compliance test, uh, and, and after that, we just we just work on it, and, and we are able to uh, bring insights into again small areas where I think I think the I think the way you look at this is is if you combine six or seven, or you know some amount of finite data sets, fundamental and alternative combined, you can have a very good view of the world. And then you say, okay, I've got these two or three things that I'm, which I think are gonna be key for this company going forward, and that's where you go opportunistic on where do I get that information? And you bring those data sets in, it's about being at the right place, right time, right data set, and that's how you crack the puzzle. Okay. Adam, do you have anything to, to, to contribute to that in terms of how, how these, the, the vendors are potentially looking at this data and linking it across standard data and, and alternative data? I think by and large, all the vendors do um, a really good job doing that. Um, like everything that we see on the receiving end uh, is, you know, typically good quality. And maybe we're just lucky with the vendors, but it's a very good quality data that comes, and that's, you know, that's what we test for mm -hmm. at the early on stage of due diligence process. So, so FSID, um, they're kind of suggesting that there, there's hackathons, right? They have uh, vendors and, and buyers as well that take hackathons and try and just test this data and try and break it and see, see how it works, um, which is obviously outside of the normal process that some of these firms would be taking this data. So how do you guys, you know, and there's, again, there's no standard. So how do you guys see these kind of hackathons? You know, is it like the the Facebook you know, network uh, film where everybody's sitting, taking tequila shots and trying to hack in into the systems, right? Is that what you guys are doing on a daily basis or is that just, is that just film? We do it with sparkling water, but I think, I think, uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I think that's, that's the way to solve this problem. I don't think any one person has the expertise to go and say, I got it and I'll solve the problem. So uh, it's, it's a, it's a problem of unpre unprecedented magnitude and scale and, and, and just, I mean, I, I think my skill sets from my formal education are all uh, obsolete. Mm. So it's really about embracing the new ways of doing things, embracing the new talent, uh, you know, not, people not even with college degrees, and, but you gotta have a passion, you gotta come together as a team, you gotta come with like, deep expertise in one area and curiosity to understand everyone else around the table. It's got to be a very s small team. Uh, that's when, you know, the feedback loop is what matters and then and, and being able to understand everyone and then s sort of uncovering insights is really critical. So I'm glad you raised the point of hackathons. I think it's a, an essential process as you look towards alt data. Yeah, new generation, alternative data. I mean, it's, it's, 
it's exactly like a, the, you know, it's complete data generation, technology generation that we're in. So we have to take different kinds of approaches to, to look at this data. So um, how about with yourself, Amanda? Yeah, we, on the other hand, won't do anything without tequila shots. Uh, yeah, so, medicinal. So it starts there. But, um, but we've, had, we've had luck that... Can we get five tequila shots, please, up here? Thank you very much. My treat. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been, we've been very lucky that a lot of the banks as well have taken us up, not just on the tequila shots, but on the, uh, on the hackathon idea. And uh, we, we're more than happy to give, give data out to, to anybody that wants to do back test. Um, within the banks, there's been maybe five or six already. Um, hackathons using Ravenpack data. Uh, we're also very active in the academic community. Um, we thought early on it would be useful and helpful to even our business just to give it out for free to a lot of academic institutions. Ultimately, it became a business line for us in that a lot of probably 60 or 70 of the top 100 universities in the world license our data to teach. Uh, and the librarians, which are in charge of, of buying data, actually use it uh, as part of the academic program. We're also on the WARDS system, the Wharton Research Data Service. Which uses CompuStat, which is exactly, S&P stuff. Exactly, which uses pretty much every other major financial data service. So it's great for teaching, and there's a lot of activities and a lot of hackathons taking place inside universities to crack the problem of using different types of data sets to make sort of better financial models. Um, and Frank, so in terms of, you know, if you, when you start you know, looking at third parties to ingest that data, um, what kind of policies, what kind of tick boxes are you looking? You know, is this kind of, what you want to hear and, and the test, uh, the results, do you want to look at that? Um, and then also, how do you ingest that? So it's probably feeds, but are you guys looking at the cloud? Are you looking at desktop? Uh, visualization, is that pretty important as well? Right, yeah, so and I think on, on the hackathon stuff, I mean, within Fidelity, we do a lot of this. Uh, we're across the different um, groups within Fidelity, uh, we have a lot of idea generating events where um, people get awards and then we try to implement these in, in very short periods of time or test it out. Um, and, and of course, we use a ton of third-party data as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, at this point, it's all moving to the cloud. I, I'm not sure I understand the question correctly. But yeah, um, yeah, so <laughs> th that's, that was the first part. The second part was, you know, is it feeds, is it cloud? What is the method of ingestion that Fidelity prefers? Right, yeah, so it's definitely all moving into the cloud. And, uh, and I think, as, as you mentioned as well, the visualization is, is key because you can't analyze or can't look at these masses of data without that. So I think, again, I think Fidelity being so big, we have, uh, we have an innovation group or F Fidelity lab uh, where they really focus exclusively on, on how to analyze these data, make them visible, and then work with the different parts of the organization where they may say, um, oh, we have this new data set that we are really interested in. Can we work with you to make it uh, more digestible, uh, visual, and, uh, and see how we can leverage this. Here's the idea that you mentioned, Adam, that it's, it's really key to have an economic idea behind it or an investment idea, um, but then work with, um, with Fidelity Labs on uh, analyzing the data and making it visual and, and useful. And so in, in terms of Samir, he mentioned, um, you know, look for the problem and then, and then comes the data. So uh, again, for, for Marto Capital, um, comment on the, on the hackathons, you know, that testing, do you guys look at that? And then secondly, you know, what, what are some of the problems that you guys are trying to, to maybe use alternative data to, to provide a solution? The, from my experience, the biggest kind of maybe a very obvious insight, right, is that it takes people with true passion for the data. So it's a different skill set than developers, different skill set even than DBAs, different skill sets with uh, than uh, um, you know visualization um, experts. Somebody who has passion for the data will be the person who who is going to proactively look for all sorts of issues that will come um, that may manifest themselves down the road. Um, and you know, that, that's you know, building a team with these types of skill sets is, um, and focusing on core data skill sets at the point of data ingestion. That's probably you know, one of the uh, biggest lessons learned. Um, on, the, on the ingestion side, there is a, uh, you know, the challenge obviously that you know, smaller uh, asset managers have is ability to consume data from different type of vendors. So there's Bloomberg data, obviously there's market data, there's uh, um, all sorts of alternative data providers. At the end of the day, we all internally have to build data systems that will consolidate it and kind of make it all transparent to the end users where the data came from. Uh, you know, that's 
you know, one thing that I've been discussing with multiple um, data vendors, uh, which is, you know, how do you streamline that solution? Would you be able to provide a solution that actually allows me to incorporate other people's data into the data set, um, data store that the vendor would be providing and make it easier and more seamless to integrate? Because at the end of the day, it's naive for any vendor to imagine that they would be the only um, source of the data uh, to any asset manager. And does it come down to, you know, again, this linking, the linking of data to the identifiers, to the parent subsidiaries, you know, is that something, well, we find in S&P that that is a, a, a big challenge where um, you get m and news, you get, you get news that's out there as well on potential, on potential um, mergers, and so to make sure that the alternative data is linked to the fundamental data and back to the GV keys, the ICNs, the QCIPs, is quite a big challenge that clients are looking at. So is that something? Our data tends to be much simpler than that, so we don't we don't have that problem. Great. Well, I'll turn on here. Uh, so then, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the lessons that you guys have learned from from clients um, being in this very new sort of field, you know, what are the, what are some of the lessons that that kind of come out um, that are really key um, in in the industry right now? So uh, for me and for us, I think I think. Uh, this is a game you need to play. This is a game which is not gonna have an overnight uh, outcome. So you have to stay patient. You have to buy into it. And I think you'll be building for the long term once you embark on this. And it's, 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 it's a slow evolutionary change. It's gonna transform the DNA of an investment firm. Uh, and I think, I, think, I think we believe that that's where uh, the secular move is happening. Yeah, I agree with, with what you said earlier about you know, sort of the, the, the mapping and stuff. There, there are all these little nuances, right, that, that you need to be aware of if you want to play this game, right, and if you want to play it well, right, because anybody can play the game, but, but the question is whether you're any good at it. And if you want to be good at it, you're going to have to figure out what these uh, little problems are, and you're going to have to have a strategy to solve them, right? And if it's about incorporating data that maps to a tradable security, then you need to make sure that you have a plan as to how you're going to map any, any future observations um, happening in, in more real time to what you're trading and making sure that you're keeping up to date with you know, any of those changes. Because ultimately, if those mappings are not correct, if your relationships or your network graph is not correct or up to date, then you will be essentially putting something into production that isn't what you back tested or what, what you thought you had incorporated. And I think that's going to be an, imp is an important part in playing this game. Then the second thing is making sure that whatever you back test, um, that you're able to um, validate that those results, specifically the data that is being furnished by the data provider, correlates well with what you saw in the back test, specifically around uptime and support and reactions and recoveries, because every vendor will have glitches, right, and there will be downtime. But you need to be able to, to measure how effective they are at maintaining the levels or the S SLAs that they that they tell you they're going to have. Because again, I've seen more, more than once firms uh, buying into a back test and buying into a model and then going into production and within a week blowing up like, in, like you wouldn't imagine, right? And, and it's not just about the money you spend on the data, but it's the cost that it has to your organization in putting bad, bad data into, the play, into play. Um, so we're gonna uh, turn to questions, maybe after uh, one more question up here, so if you guys have any, get them, and do get them ready. Um, I wanna just go back to just that ingestion, uh, because you know, in in ingestion linked to sort of security and what the cloud poses in terms of s security. Um, and I'm gonna go back to, to Samir in terms of, you know, how, how do you guys, uh, what, what are clients, what's the preferred method of ingestion for, for clients and how does the cloud, for example, um, you know, what problems does that, that present because of the security element uh, and, and again, being hacked? Um, and how do you guys tackle that at your organization? I think cloud is the future. Um, so, I mean, Fra Frank mentioned Fidelity, I would call is a very, very, conservative and a very prestigious asset manager, the fact that Frank is also saying that you know, cloud is where it's all happening. And from my perspective, I think, I think without cloud, you just can't be nimble. I think, I think this is, uh, again, going back to how do you deal with, uh, you mentioned, Paul, lots of data sets coming. There's thousands of data sets. Yeah. 
uh, if you were to do ingestion through firewalls and this and that, and we do some of those because either vendors only have it set up that way, it can be extremely time consuming. You know, add to that the process it takes through legal and compliance, and by the time you've gotten to the data, the opportunity is gone. So I think, I think, I think you know, if you truly, and AI, by the way, is about testing things really fast, and at each step of the way, it's like a decision tree. You learn something new, and then you go down that path. For those who have computer science, it's like a massive binary tree, and you can just get lost if you don't prune the tree and, and, and go sort of trace the right, right path. So I think, I, think, I think cloud plays a big role in, in, in making sure that the discovery mm -hmm. between data, uh, data producer and the data consumer, and the time lag is, is, is shrunk, not to mention all the tools that then uh, the cloud provider, pro providers are building, you know, whether it's AWS or Google or Microsoft, those tools you don't want to recreate. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, there's just no point, but those are extremely powerful tools to then bring to bear on the data. So I'm a big believer in cloud and uh, what's happening there. Um. Okay, so in terms of, uh, just one last question for everybody here, just where do you see alternative data going in the, in the future? What, what, what's what's going to happen in the next sort of five years from each one of your perspectives? From my perspective, I imagine there's going to be a lot of consolidation. Uh, there has been a huge investment of alternative data where all sorts of vendors went after that for all good reasons. Um, there is going to be an effort, probably a process of sorting through what is really insightful and what is useful and then what is not. And that consolidation has to happen. Frank? Yeah, I would agree. I think there will be a few vendors who probably will succeed. And I think uh, more and more, particularly large companies, will, will really focus on using and, and analyzing their proprietary data. Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot more players uh, playing the game. And you're going to see a few winners and a lot of losers. A lot more transparency in the data market, and it could, in fact, be uh, data could become a tradable asset on an exchange with uh, pricing discovered through market forces. Okay. Brilliant. Um, OK, do we have any uh, questions for our panel uh, out there? Camille, I know that usually Camille has a question uh, for. Oh, well, that's good. That's good to hear. So uh, any questions at all for the panel in terms of uh, due diligence, alternative data sets, ingestion of the security? We haven't asked anything about uh, GDPR, but no? Okay. Well, thank you very much to our panel. Thank you very much to Beryl. Um, we'll speak to you later. Thank you. Thank you.